We are live. Do, 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 do. Sort myself out. One. One trust PowerPoint, can you? Can everyone see my screen okay? Flow interactions. The only tool that brings all the animation power of CSS and JavaScript. Sorry. <laughs> uh, everyone hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. All right, welcome everybody. Here we go again. Uh, version 2.0. This is the one you really want to listen to. Uh, Roger is here. We've got uh, a bunch of people here. Thank you for taking the time to, to attend. And I've changed the title a little bit from before. From, uh, from kind of chatting with Roger. Uh, so I've, I've labelled it using Excel in kind of 2020. Um, because from what from what I could tell from a few emails with Roger, and I guess we'll find out when we get going, but yes, there'll be some let function, uh, there'll be some dynamic arrays, uh, a bit of index, which is always good. And uh, I guess the rest we wait and see. Uh, usual stuff that I mentioned, so apologies, a bit boring for those regulars and, and stuff. But these are our next two upcoming events. Uh, so next week now, uh, slightly different time of 12 o'clock, uh, lunchtime for those in Europe. Uh, we have Wynne Hopkins with a Power Query session. Uh, please don't be too put off by the title, you know, beyond the basics. You know, if you're somebody who's quite new to Power Query, I'm sure you'll still get something from it. And then we've got um, Oakley. I don't know if he's here today, is he? I haven't seen him yet. Um, but I guess some, some classic Excel, if you want to call it that, on Tuesday the 24th at six o'clock, where we're going to look at customizing Excel to work for us, uh, which is something that I don't think a lot of people necessarily do. They use the Excel that have been given, but um, Oakley's going to be changing settings, you know, customizing toolbars, various things to tailor Excel for, for us. It's our Excel and it should be best for us. Uh, so that's the next two, two sessions for November. And uh, December is in the works. Uh, hopefully news coming soon. Uh, Roger, are you, uh, if I'll stop sharing, are you ready to rock and roll? Just lost you. I can hear you, mate. Can you? Yeah, okay. yeah. Can you hear me now? You can hear yeah. you, Roger. Sorry, sir. It's very strange at this end. <clears throat> We can hear you and we can see you. Yeah, right. Uh, so are you waiting for me to start? Yes. Yeah, go for it. Okay, Share sorry. <laughs> it broke up, but I missed a lot of what you were saying, Alan, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'll say well, hi, everybody. Thank you it. very much for joining us What this evening here in the UK. And I'm most sorry to say that I wasn't able to join you last Tuesday, uh, Tuesday night last week, as I was supposed to, but I got whipped into hospital with a suspected heart attack. But fortunately, I hadn't had a heart attack at all, but uh, all a false alarm. But seven and a half hours in the emergency department when I should have been speaking to you. So apologies, everybody. And thank you, Alan, for stepping into the breach. And I apologize now if what I say this evening is going to reiterate some of what Alan did. I didn't see a recording of it, so I've no idea what he talked to you about. <clears throat> but um, I'm going to talk to you about the let function, basically. But to show the let function properly, I want to use several of the dynamic array functions. <clears throat> so if, <clears throat> if any of you have not yet seen the dynamic array functions, I thought we'd better just whip through some of those first of all. So at least you'll know what it is I'm talking about. <clears throat> so I'll share my screen now and we'll um, make a bit of a start. 
Uh, I said to Taya at the beginning, I never ever can follow any chat that's going on during these things, so I will not be looking at any chat screen. I won't see any questions you've put up. But I've asked Taya and Alan to interrupt me at any point if there's something which people are asking which I've not explained properly. I don't mind being interrupted at any point during my presentation, and I'll try and answer the questions there and then. Okay? So, let's have a go. Can you see my screen? Sure can. Yes, we can. You can? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to start off with um, something which our Donald likes to call fake data. This is fake data, but uh, if he called this fake data, he'd be telling the truth for once in his life. But there we go. Uh, this is just some made up data. It's some um, I created myself uh, just using RAN between and some uh, X lookups to create this set of data. <clears throat> so this is the file we're going to be looking at. And I want to look first of all. Um, the first of the sort functions I'd like to look at is unique. Now, this table, which we just looked at, is called underscore TB sales 19. Um, nearly all my named ranges and my tables, I always start off with an underscore. Uh, I like to do that because when I'm using autocomplete when building a formula, if I do underscore TB, I can see a list of all of the tables in that particular file without having to try and remember what they are. Um, so you'll see underscore TB being used quite a lot. So <clears throat> in that file, and I've just put a little copy of it across here to remind you, there is a field called name which is the names of all the various people who've made the sales. And if we put into a cell unique TB sales 19 name, which I've put into this cell here, it gives me a list of just the unique names from the several hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands that happen to be within the given table. Now, like all dynamic array formulae, the formula only exists in that first cell where I have typed it. You can see it up there in the formula bar. Um, but it's got this area going around it. And that is the spill range. Well, that's the unique set of names that exist within all of those rows. And it spills down to cover that 12 rows there. If I look at this cell here, the formula is there, but as you can see, it is grayed out. So I can't do anything with that formula in that cell. Uh, that is the only cell which carries the formula and the results of the formula spill down as far as it needs to go. Now, if I happened to have had something else sat in between, <clears throat> I would get this spill error, which is one of the new errors from the dynamic arrays. And that's Excel telling me, you know, look, I want to carry on down here, but there's something sat in my way. So would you please get rid of it so I can do the task which I've been asked to do? So if I delete the word hello, then it can carry on and it will produce <coughs> the spilled range. Now, if I were to add some new names, so if I say, instead of Barry there, we put Alan, and instead of Simon there, we put Zach. When I go back here, lo and behold, it is automatically updated. So we got Alan and Zach appearing in the list along with all of the other names that were there before. Here, I've done exactly the same thing <clears throat> with the products column from that table. And those are the, the unique list of phones that exist within that file. Same thing applies. Formulas in that cell, there's the spill range. If you see, stick something in the middle or anywhere within it, you can't do it. So it says, oh, hello, get rid of it. So delete that and it works again. <clears throat> 
So that's giving us just the unique items within. But we can also have a new function called sort. And I can pass unique to sort. So if I say equal sort unique table sales name, I've now got that set of names with Alan at the top and Zach at the bottom. So they are in alphabetic order. But there are some other parameters. And so if I say sort a minus minus one, I can do it in reverse. So I've got Zach at the top going through to Alan at the bottom. Now, of course, there are two definitions of unique. In the examples above, we're just showing the single instance of a value from a range which contains multiple instances of those values. Now, some people say that that is not unique and the unique items are just those that occur once. Well, the full syntax of unique, which we'll come back to in just a moment, does allow for that. So if I use the extra syntax, I can bring out only the only names which appear in the file once are Alan and Zach, because those are the ones I just added. So the total syntax for the sort or the unique formula is uh, it's unique. And then you have to give it an array, the range of data from which you want to select unique items. By call, false or zero or omitted to unique by row true or a one to give unique by column. So the array you're looking at can be a horizontal array or a vertical array. And exactly once, if you set that to one or true, that will give you the value occurring exactly once, zero or omitted to give all. So by saying unique table sales names, zero comma one, so that's saying we want it by, uh, by column, uh, but by, by row, and then one to say we only want the once, and that gives us the single occurrence of those items. So that, you know, in most cases, we just want to get the, the full list, but you can get just the ones which occur once and only once within there. The sort function also has a lot more parameters to it. So again, the full syntax of it is sort by array, the range to be sorted, sort index, the row number or the column number that you wish to sort by, the sort order, the direction of the sort, where we choose one for ascending and minus one for descending. And then the last parameter by call, if you leave it out or you know, put it to zero, it will sort the normal way, which is by row. But if you set it to one, it will sort by column. So looking at that little table again there, I, this is just a, a shorter version of it, which I've called TB short, because it's just this little piece we did on the screen where we can see it. Um, where I've said sort TB short, hash data, I want to sort all of it, by column five, ascending. So column five is the product. So we can now see that data has been sorted. So we got all the Bs and the Hs and the Is going through the list. So we told it to sort by column five and we told it to sort ascending. If we'd asked it to do it by, uh, if we put a, a, a minus one on there, then we'd have had it in, in the reverse order. And here I've said sort, comma, 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 one. So I'm looking at the header row and I put the final parameter of one. So it's now sorted the whole table in order of the, um, the column heading. So we got color, customer, date, month, etc., through to value as opposed to date, name, customer, etc. So sort is a very, very powerful function and uh, can be used in all sorts of ways. But there's also 
an additional one called sought by. Now, that's something <clears throat> when I was talking with Joe McDade, who was the senior program manager on this uh, on this project, uh, he was telling me, I said, I use sought by a lot. And he said, I'm delighted about that, Roger, because he's had a lot of trouble getting them to keep that in. And people said we didn't need it with all the other things we've got. But I think it's brilliant because you can sort it by something which is outside of the table itself. So here I've got my unique list of names again. And alongside it, I've done a formula which says sum ifs table sales 19 value where table sales 19 name is equal to whatever is in this cell here, the spilled cell. I'll come on and discuss what this little hash sign is on the end in, a, in just a while. So that's now calculated the total sales value by each person in that list. So I've got the list now alongside of alongside the name of the total value of their sales. So now I can do a sort by, I can sort this by this, these values here. And we now have them in a different order where Roger is coming at the end, because uh, I'm going ascending there. And on this one, I'm sorting it descending. Um, you'll note, by the way, that this data is not as random as it perhaps should be, because I'm the best salesperson, of course, <laughs> followed by my wife, Mandy, followed by my son, Jack. So there's a little bit of a bias introduced into this ram between, because I couldn't have myself appearing at the bottom. <laughs> But um, anyway, so we 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 are fake data, but it's not totally ran between. It was a it was fixed. I can fix anything. So let's let's look at the the parameters for this sort by because it's it's a very important thing. So again, we can put the array to be sorted by array one. Which array one? Which array you want to sort it by? And then the sort order, which is one for ascending and minus one for descending. But you'll see as you try and type in the function, you get array by array, whatever, and then the sort order. And once you've done that, it will give you the offer of another array and another sort order. And again, more and more and more. So you could sort a table by various fields within that table, and the fields themselves could be sorted in ascending or descending order. So a very, very, very powerful function, and one which I make a lot of use of in everything that I do now I'm using dynamic arrays. Now, if anybody's got any questions at that point, then please leap in, and I'll try and deal with it before we move on to the next function I want to cover, which is transpose. Now we've had transpose for years and years and years. <clears throat> and with the old calc engine, transpose function exists, but if you wanted to transpose a vertical set of data to horizontal, you would first have to select the horizontal range of the same dimensions as vertical lift and use control plus shift plus enter. So if I wanted to transpose this, I would select this and I would have to have to have selected that range there first and said equals transpose B5 to B9. And then when I committed it, I'd press control shift and enter and we'd have had the curly braces put into the formula by Excel, not typed in by the user. And that would then put the data across the way the other way. So if I went and changed Don there now to Roger, then lo and behold, it changes up here to Roger because that formula in that cell of those cells, it's not in one cell, it's actually within all of those cells, is taking the data from there. 
So in addition to the three new Dynamic Arrays functions I've shown you so far, there is a new transpose function. So anything can be wrapped inside the transpose function. And again, you don't need to use control shift enter as you don't with any of the sort or things which we looked at previously. Control shift enter is now a thing of the past. We don't need it. So if I say transpose sort unique table sales 19 name, I've now got the names going horizontally across the page, running from Alan through to Zach. Um, but equally, <clears throat> I could have said, um, so B12 hash, I must have put that on a different page. Uh, I've altered something since then, but don't worry about it. But basically, we can we can either we can do our sorts, we can do our uniques, but then we can also cause it to go across the page as opposed to up and down the page. So, with two just two formulae, one in cell B30 and one in cell C29, we've now in fact created the outline for producing a crosstab report, which we can do by using some if formulae. So here I've got my sort unique table cells name. I've got them there. Here I've got transpose sort unique product. And we're going that way. And now if I wanted to, I could just put a some ifs formula in here. And um, I could then just fill it in with all of the data. Uh, boom. What have I not told you? Because on this, yes, I'd created some named ranges, but like, let's just put it in here so you can see. Equals some ifs underscore value uh, comma name um, uh, dollars B thirty comma underscore product oh, product two and it's name two sorry comma C dollars twenty nine brackets let's just go and put that back in there as a name to and it should have been underscore and Alan didn't sell any Samsung's but uh, there we got the sales for each of those people and then in the typical cross tap report we would just put it across and it would do the calculations going the other way. For some reason, my machine is running very slowly, but there we go. And that's a typical way in which we would have done a cross-tab report. What I hadn't told you is I had created some named ranges. So I've got something called value two which is pointing at a part of, I've just said table sales 19 value. I've just called the underscore value. Um, I'd use this file in giving a talk about named ranges and how you can use just assign a name to just a column of a table, just to make it shorter for typing your formula. Um, if anyone me to explain that I'm more than happy to do so but I find it much easier to just type in a simple thing like that than having to type in all of the table name and then the brackets and then the um, the column heading so that's a typical way in which we would have used to create a cross tab report but we're making use of the fact that we've pulled out the unique names we've pulled out the unique products and we've created a cross tab report okay yep um, you might be about to show this, I don't know, uh, but there's a question 
regarding showing the Samif's formula, but using yeah. the spill reference? Using the? Uh, the spill ref, the hash. Yeah, um, exactly. I, I'm going to be it. talking about this yeah. new kid on the block next. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> We have a new kid on the block. <laughs> <laughs> so you preempted me. Um, yeah, defined names can be a static name range like my data is equal to new kid B2 to K9, or it could be uh, VAT rate equals T4. In T4, I got 20%, and VAT amount is. Uh, J3, this figure up here, multiplied by VAT rate, and it gives us the answer. Or they can refer to dynamic ranges as previously spoken about, but not in this particular talk. I do beg your pardon. But anyway, <clears throat> now we've got a new kid on the block since the advent of dynamic arrays. When we create this here, this unique table sales name, I can also refer to that by typing into this cell equals C14 hash, C14, and the hash on the end of it. The hash symbol, this is the new kid, after the cell address, this tells Excel that this is the spill anchor. It is the top left cell of the spill range which the dynamic array formula produces. So if it's only a single vector, a single column, it's still the top left. But if it was a complete uh, rectangular array, the C14 hash would always be the top left cell which holds the spill formula, and that is the spill anchor. But that is defining a range in exactly the same sort of way as named ranges work. So if I said equals index C14 hash comma five, so that would say I want the fifth element of the range that is in C14 hash. One, two, three, four, five. Lo and behold, it is two. So we can address this new range with index and pull out individual values. So here we have a formula where I've said sum if table sales 19 value, where table sales 19 product is equal to C31 hash. Yes, what you are asking, and where table sales 19 name is equal to D30 hash. So I've only got one single formula, and that has done that some product, uh, that um, some ifs formula for me across the whole range. And once again, if I go and type in hello somewhere in the middle of it, bang. I get this same spill error that we'd seen previously because Excel is saying, Oi, get out of there. You've got something sat in the way of the area that I need to fill to satisfy the conditions of that formula. So get rid of whatever's blocking the way and back comes your result. So yes, yes, I deliberately did it the old fashioned way here just to show how much easier it is now. Now we've got this new kid we can refer to because it makes it nice and easy to produce the result that we want. Um, but in just the same way as I was talking about indexing the C14 hash up the top there just now, if I say index D31 hash, comma six, comma eight, now D31 hash is this cell here. So if we index that cell, hash, comma six, comma eight, I'm saying I want the sixth row and the eighth column. And the sixth row and the eighth column should be 
7287, which is that one there, <coughs> which is the result we got. And if we index D30 hash comma 8 to tell us who the person is, well, D30 hash is this, and the eighth element is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Mandy. Well, we get the answer, Mandy in the cell there. So index D31 hash 6 comma 8, index D30 hash comma 8. Thing. So, <coughs> so you can see that the, the new kid, the hash, it's defining a range in exactly the same way as we might have done with our name to formulae in the past. And we can tackle that with the index function and pull out any individual elements any time we want. I just need to take a sip of water if you don't mind. Right. Um, now, because I had named some formally in here, again, <clears throat> we can write the whole thing much more easily. Some ifs, value 2, because I defined what value t 2 was, where product 2 is C57 hash and name 2 is D56 hash. I should have said at the outset, <clears throat> as I've said many times when I give a talk, I'm an exceedingly lazy person. I type the minimum amount I can. I hate long formulae. I hate having to type formulae twice. And so I always try and make things nice and short. So in the past, I've always made use of named ranges, named formulae, I should say, to give me a pointer to a range I want to use rather than using the long form of it. So that's, um, that's the way in which this new kid works and it's very powerful and it gives us a whole range of data that is produced by the dynamic array formula. The other new thing that's come in is filter. Now, filter's great. So again, I've got this, you know, set of data here. And um, the filter function, I've copied it off the web somewhere, the definition of it. Um, the, the syntax is filter array, the array you want to filter, include which items you want to include. So it's giving it a set of criteria. And then there's an optional extra thing, which you can say, if it's empty, give me, tell you what to put in if you get an empty result. So the filter function is very clever. It's very, very good. So if we say here, product and Nokia, and I say filter that table. So filter, this is this is underscore TB3 is what this one is called, I think. Why is it not? Oh, perhaps they've got another page, doesn't matter. Um, Lose him. Hello. Oh, my mute you, see, you my mute went on and came off again. So, did did you miss anything there? Lost your screen. You lost my screen. Yes, we have actually. Yeah. Oh, how long ago? <laughs> oh, just a minute. Just a Hello. <laughs> Video is still on. Oh, sharing got put off for some yeah. reason. Here we go. Are we back? Yep. Yeah. Right. Where did, where did I lose you? <laughs> oh, just just about up to date. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm trying to filter this table where the product is Nokia. Okay. So I've said filter... This is table three, where table three product is equal to what's in cell L28. 
And you can see I just got a list of Nokias from this set of data. Now, I haven't bothered with the, uh, the optional if empty parameter, but uh, you could, if there was something which is empty, you could tell it what to put in place of it. Now, that's showing me all of the columns from the source table, which is not necessarily what I want. And I had long, long, long discussions with Joe McDade when he first showed me Filter. And I said, look, Joe, Filter's nice, it's clever, it doesn't require any VBA, but it doesn't do half the things that I can do with Advanced Filter. My beloved Advanced Filter, which we've had for donkey's years, and most people don't seem to use. Um, so I said, with Advanced Filter, I can say, I don't want to see all of those columns, and I don't. If I've asked for Nokia, I trust Excel. I trust Excel totally. So why the hell do I want to see the word Nokia appearing all the way down the screen? I don't. It's just a load of rubbish. But he said, oh, well, you can always apply another filter to it. And that's absolutely right. So we could pass the result of one filter to another filter. And the second filter, we can give an array by putting it within curly brackets of noughts and ones to say the columns we want to naught exclude, one include. So now I could say, now I've got the same result, but I'm only showing the name, the region, the color, the quantity, and the value. So that's, that's a heap better because I haven't got as much, much stuff to look at. And I don't want to look, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm not interested in. And especially, you know, with some tables one has, they're yay wide, you know, they're massive. They could be sort of multiple hundreds of columns. And you don't want to see all of that. There's only certain things you need to see. But the other thing is with filter, you can have multiple criteria and logic. And the answer is when you, you know, the, the reason for that is if you look back at what this thing says up here, it's a set of criteria such as Boolean arrays of trues and falses. So you can pass to filter an array. So we could say we want something where the product is Samsung and the color is silver. And the way in which we do that, where have I put the formula? No, I guess it's in here somewhere. Right. So we say index table three, filter sequence rows table three, where table three product is equal to L99 times color is equal to M99. So we'll get a series of trues where the product is equal to Samsung and trues where color is equal to M99. And when you multiply true by true, you get a one. So therefore you'll get the result. If either of those gives a zero, you get a false. So therefore it won't show. And again, we can say, in this case, we're doing filtering and we're just using some things to bring up to the end. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on so we can, we can come back to that. But basically, you can do multiple criteria. So where you say, if where range one is equal to criteria one multiplied by a range two is equal to criteria two. And you could go on, range three is equal to criteria three and so on. So you could filter down as much as you wish in that manner. Now, uh, so yeah, filter, whilst I was a little bit unhappy about it to start off with, I'm much, much happier now because there are so many more things that you can actually do with it. So it's another 
fantastic tool in the armory. Um, just to flip across at the moment to see what I was talking about with advanced filter. With advanced filter, you can set at the top of the page your criteria and you can then filter out from your data list. Again, I've got a data list here, same sort of way uh, on the instructions, how advanced filter works. Well, if entries are on the same row, they're anded. So if I have month June, name Roger, product iPhone, color red, it means I want all of those to be true. But if I put them on successive rows, they are odd. So this is saying I want June and product Nokia, or I want July and product Nokia. Um, and, you know, equally the same thing. You can say month not equal to June and region not equal to West. And you can have as many of these as you wish. And then extract range, you put them out at the end. So here, we've done the fil filter to only pull out name, Roger, product, Motorola. Now, I've got use VBA, I've got it switched off at the moment. If I change that to Rachel, and I go and uh, that this is how advanced filter is done manually. Filter. I don't want the filter in place. I want to copy to another location. The criteria range is what I've just put in. No, I didn't. It's B2 to C3. So the criteria range is this. My list range, I happen to remember, is called underscore dr data. That's the information in this data list over here. And where do I want to copy it to? I want to copy it to this range here. Um, oh. Do you mean that C C thirty three in the next field? Quite quite here. That there should be that. And uh, where I want to put it is to B ten through to F ten. So I say okay, and now I just picked up Rachel. Okay. Now the the. The default with uh, advanced filter, if you just say the extract range is a single cell, it will put everything out in exactly the same order that you had it originally. But you can go and put names into cells and they can be in different orders altogether so I could say I wanted value there and I wanted month there. And if I went and ran that advanced filter again, uh, copy another location, it seems to forget that each time, which is a bit of a pain in the butt, but there we go. Underscore the our data. Oops. What have I done wrong now? What have I done wrong? What did I do wrong? Let's put those back to what they were. I don't know what I did there. But anyway, basically, you can, instead of, if I just given B10 as the uh, output location, I'd have got the names of all of the fields going across the page in the same order. But you can 
type in there into any range of cells what you want to see, and you'll only see those cells in that order. And that, to me, is quite important. And you can automate it, because if I switch VBA on, there's only a few lines of code you need behind the scenes. And if I go and just make that into an R on its own, well, advanced filter mains, oh, I've cocked something up. I'm very sorry, guys. But basically, you can have it so that if something changes there, you trigger a bit of code and you get the new range in. So advanced filter has always been able to do lots and lots of lovely things. And the new filter didn't seem to be able to do that. But as I've got to play with filter more and more, and I realize you can do filtering a filter and therefore only bring out the columns you want, that was a lot, lot better. But what you'll see in a moment is we can also do a little bit better than that as well. So let's move across and look at the start of the, the let function. I can come back to that advanced filter later if any, anybody wants to. Because the great thing about advanced filter is we've got it, um, we've got it every, I think every version of Excel from about Excel 5 onward. The let function, absolutely brand new, came out just a few months ago did it. If you look back to BASIC, which started in way back in 1964, one of the functions in BASIC was the LET function. So it's not terribly new. When I first started playing about with writing code, I used BASIC and I used to write code with line numbers and using these functions which were available to us back then. Let C equals A times 2.5 plus B and something like that. Um, also, back in those days, way, way, way back in the history of time, as old oldies can remember, there was a def for define and that was the the origin of UDFs, as they were, because it was an introduced programmer defined functions. You know, that's exactly what we have today. We have UDFs, don't we? <laughs> so, anyway, we're not here to do a less history lesson on uh, on basic, but just to show you that let is a very, very old term known to programmers for many, many years. Now, what is the let function? Well, <clears throat> I don't think Excel or Microsoft did themselves any favors when they put up the help file for let function. Yeah, it describes it, but you know, really? Yes, we've got let, and then you can give a variable name followed by a comma, and then the value you want to give to that name. And you can have any number of pairs of these names and values before you finally get to a calculation. So the simple example, let x comma 1, x plus 1, answer 2. And there we've got it. That cell there has the formula in it. Something's going stupidly wrong here. Why am I not refreshing and seeing? What's in the cell? Why is... Ah, there we are. Don't know why. Something going wrong with my machine tonight. It's playing silly buggers. Um, right, let x comma 1. So we said let x equal 1. And then the formula x plus 1, and that gives us the answer. And then you can go on a bit more, and you can say, you know, x comma 1. Here I've said let x equal 2, y equal 3, z equal 6, x plus y times z. So we've got 2 plus 3 times 6 equals 30, which is quite correct. And you could do other things. 
So if we're trying to calculate an area, so we've got the radius of five, then if we say let pi equal 3.142, radius equal the value in cell D23, and then I've said the answer, I've got some text, area equals, and it's pi times radius squared to the power of two square centimeters. And if we wanted the circumference, we can have the formula let pi again equal 3.142, radius equals d23, circumference equals pi times radius times 2, because it's pi times diameter and diameter is twice the radius. So the let function will always have an uneven number of arguments you can have up to 126 pairs of names and values with a final calculation. Any name can be used as part of any other name that precedes it, but it cannot use a name which is declared later. I've given some more examples here of calculating the circumference and volume, volumes of a cylinder, volumes of a cone. Well, you probably think this out. Well, this is great if I want to teach my kids some math at school so they can do their calculations. It's great, you know, we can use it for that, but that's not really very, very clever. Um, by the way, there is another limitation here, which one of our Excel MVPs came across um, about the number of pairs and names. Uh, there is a, been a limit in Excel for donkey's years of is it 8,192 characters in a cell. Well, behind the scenes, let uses a few other things, so you can't actually get 8,192 characters into a cell currently. I think it's limited to about 6,000, but I don't think too many people can be bothered about that. <laughs> Anyway, so using my same set of lovely fake data, which is not so fake, um, efficiency. If you were to write a formula, um, oh, we come on to using that table in a minute, but if we had some uh, results in a school. We've got names of people and their scores for English, maths, history, geography, and then a grade. Well, you know, the horrible way of doing that, if the sum of table seven English to geography is greater than 320, then an A. If the sum of that is greater than 280, a B. If the sum is greater than whatever, I put it broken down here so you can see it more easily. Now, that's a horrible way of creating the result here. Um, obviously, nobody in their right mind would do it that way. You would actually use some form of lookup or X lookup or whatever to, to do the thing. But believe it or not, there are people who do do this sort of thing. And the problem there is that we are doing the sum of those columns multiple times in order to get to our result. But if we were using the let function, what we could say, that's it written out in the long way. But if you use it the way it should be done, uh, and if we just drop the thing down here. I like to always start it off and then put a alt enter at the end of each row because then you can see what you're doing more easily. So we say let total be the sum of table eight English geography. Then, so we've only done the sum once. And then we say, if the total is greater than 320, give an A. If it's greater than 280, a B. If it's greater than 250, a C. Otherwise, it's a D. So that is far, far, far more efficient than doing it the that way, because we're only doing the sum calculation once, not multiple times.
Now, in a small table like this, the difference in speed would be minimal. But if you had a table with, you know, two, three, four hundred, five hundred thousand rows in it, then it's going to make a huge difference to the time taken to do the calculation. In the same way, this is still an example that they did use in the Excel help file as well, but just use different different things. Um, <clears throat> you could say, if is blank, filter B4 to E29, 24 to E39, where B24 to B39 equals Rachel, no color, otherwise filter thing. So you're doing the filtering twice in this case, um, and filling in no color where, where there's where there are blanks in the in the table. But if you do it as a let function, you can say, okay, let the criteria be Rachel and the result be filter the whole table B25 to E40, where B25 to B40 equals criteria. So we've only done the one lot of filtering. And then we say, if is blank result, no color, otherwise result. So it's put the result in, in all cases, except if it was a blank, it filled in, no color. So that's a far, far more efficient method of doing calculations. And again, if you were doing it on big, big files, it would make a huge difference. So the let function really now is starting to come into its own by allowing us to be far more efficient in our, in our method of calculation. If we move on now to filter, let us, so this is just 200 rows in this table. And I've set myself up where I've got uh, dates in the cells here, but formatted to show just the month and the year going across the page. And I've got the products going down this way. So if we wanted to do a calculation on this, let's try and build it using the let function. I don't know where this black circles come from. All of a sudden this afternoon, when I go into a cell like that, I get this black circle appear and I've not got a clue where the hell it's come from. I must have had an update this morning and it's come in with that. What its purpose is, I have absolutely no idea. Answer I think that comes countries. from tablets, right? So that it's bigger for for tablet ah. use rather than mm. PC. Yeah, like, and somewhere perhaps I, with the update, it's got tablet mode switched on, but I don't use it on tablet anyway. Thank you for that. Um, right, equals, let. And then I like to press Alt Enter so I get a fresh row. So if we said start, oops, comma, um, this cell here. But we want it always to be row seven. So we'll put the dollar sign in there. And all pairs have to end with a comma so we do another alt en enter and if we said end comma and that's going to be eo month you don't have to type any equal signs in here at all eo month start comma zero a new comma so that's going to give us the end of the month that the start is. So we've got start and end defined. Um, so now what do we want to have? We want to have a um, uh, a sum ifs formula. So we want to have uh, I'm going to call 
split result, comma. Um, sum ifs. And what we want to sum is the value um, where the, I can't remember what we're looking at. Um, and we've got the product on that, where the product is I can't now see my blessed ah that's better where the product is that with our little hash on the end of it comma oh and I can have multiple criteria here so let us do is this a myth so I don't want to do a filter d d d d d no I'm trying to do a filter aren't I I'm trying to do a filter Roger is your value for Oh, okay. I was going to say, is your value field meant to be part of the field? But since it's... I, I, I already created it over here, so let me go. Right. Here's one you baked earlier. <laughs> you baked earlier, because I knew I'd gone and forget what I was doing. <laughs> it's it's that time of night where I'm getting confused. I... Um... Right, that's it. Okay, so month start is equal to M7. End of month, month end is EO month M start comma zero. Prod val, product value, is filter table two value where table two date is greater than or equal to M start, where table two date is less than or equal to month end, and where table two product is equal to what's in L8. And the result I want is the sum of prodval. And the last thing that you give to the let function is result. Now, I could, I could have not bothered to put result there. I could have got rid of that totally and, yes, finished at that point without the comma. But I'll tell you in a moment why I do this. So when we hit enter, we get the result we want. And we can then drag that down and we can drag it across and oh i know we can't you silly boy you can't do that you can't do that you can't do that because 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 we're using tables when you drag it goes and changes it from the table heading so what we have to do in this scenario is copy and then we have to Based and why, why have I got a calc error cropping up for something? Ah, right. It's because obviously there weren't any sales. So we need to wrap our whole thing in an if error. Alt enter. And then after that, we put a comma, nothing, and another. Oh, I, I, I should have changed that on the, uh, on the first cell and copied it across. But anyway, you, you see, you see what, 
what we'd done. Um, but the reason why I should, I should have made that change right up here and then copied across and down again. But the reason why I, oh, let's go and do it properly. Let's do it properly. Don't, don't skimp, Roger. If error, alt enter. Come, uh, nothing. Copy that down. Copy. And paste. Right, there we are. Now, my, my keyboard's up. Oh, right, okay. Thing went under. Right. The reason why I do that is because it's great when you're debugging. Um, if I, instead of typing in result there, I wanted to test whether the uh, m end function is working correctly. If I type in m end, oops. Learn to spell M um, oh. end. I would be better if I had actually typed in there. Uh, text of M end, comma, DD space, MM space, my my. M M M Y Y Right, thirty first of January. So that's quite right. Um, so it allows me to go and test any one of the previous things to see if it's working properly or if I've got a mistake. So by having your final thing you're looking for as a name with the formula that you want and then repeating it, it gives you the chance to change and test any one of the earlier things if you need to, just to make sure it's doing what it should do. So if I now put that back to being result. We get our answer. So um, you can see that by using the let function, it's much easier to set up this sort of formula. That would have been a horrible thing to write out where you're having to do in testing whether it's equal to or greater than that and then the e or month of the rest of it. It's, if you can define your start and your end, it makes it much easier then for incorporating them into the formula later. I have another example here with filter. Um, again, I can't see why I keep getting that right. Okay. This is why I wanted to show you. Um, again, this was doing that filter for product and color. Um, but setting it out in the form of a let function, again, I think it's easy to read because we say criteria one is we want table three product to be equal to whatever is in L3. Criteria two, table three color equals M3. Fil filter table three, where crit four, criteria one times criteria two. In other words, you, you've said what they are, you're testing for product color. And then that filter is going to give you your filtered result. Rows, sequence, 
number of rows in filter. So that will give you rows now going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for the number of rows that filter produces. And then the result index filter for rows, but only using columns two, eight, nine, and four. And that was the bit I wanted to actually show you is that good old index, my lovely, lovely index, probably the best function that ever existed. That allows me to take the result of the filter, index it to show only those columns that I've passed this array to. So I want columns two, eight, nine, and four. Two is name. Eight is quantity, nine is value, and four is region. So, and again, what I've done here, I said index table three headers. So that's the header row, but only give me the second, eighth, ninth, and fourth elements in that order. So I've got name, quantity, value, and region. So again, index can be used beautifully with the new filter function to only give you the columns you want in the column order that you want, which I think is absolutely crucial. So again, it's just showing you that using that formula, you can, you can just type it as that single formula, but that's, I think, quite difficult to read and understand compared with setting it out in a let function. So that's just another example of where I think let can be a lot more useful. And again, you know, uh, in, in this one here, um, if I wanted to, oops, in here, if I wanted to see what is my criteria one, of results of my criteria one. I can see I'm getting a heap of falses and trues according to whether these rows are giving false or true for that. Um, and if I did criteria two, I'd also see some falses and trues and it's the multiplication of those things there which give me results. If I type in rows, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, because there were just six rows in the result. And sequence gives you that as rows going down the page. So using that, putting that final thing that you want as another name with a paired value is I think very, very useful because it's a nice easy way of testing out all the different parts of what you've written. Because at the end of the day, this um, let function, <clears throat> to me, it's programming in a cell. You are writing a program effectively inside one cell of a spreadsheet. And the great thing about it, of course, is that it's a program not involving any VBA whatsoever. So it will work across platform. It will run on the desktop. It will run on an iPad. It will run on an Android. And it will run on the cloud version of Excel. Right, let's have another one now. Let's, <clears throat> let's look at creating a cross-tab report. That's when I got confused and started to type my sum ifs earlier. Um, let row be equal to table one name, and then sort unique row. So that sorted names going there. In this cell here, I put let column be table one product. 
and then transpose sort unique column. And then in this cell here, again, let row be table one name, data be table one value, sum ifs data where row is equal to j8 hash, j8 hash. So that's given me the total value of sales for each of the names. And similarly, here, column is TB1 product, data is still TB1 value, some ifs data where column is equal to L5. So I've got the totals going across the page. And then here, row, table one name, column, table one product, data, table one value, some ifs data where row is J8 hash, column is L5 hash, and there is my spilled result. Now, that's great, but if I didn't want to have name here, if I wanted to have a region, I've got to go to this formula. Well, I mean, it's not that own risk. It's nice and easy to see. And I just go there and I can type in the word region. Oop. It won't help unless I also make that region. So I've got to go and change it in two places. And then I get my result. I'd have to go and change this formula as well. But I told you, I'm lazy. I don't like doing that. So what if, what if we made the row and the column and the data variables? So back here on this tab here, uh, I got tables and at the moment there's only one table in this particular file is TP1 and then this cell here is transpose indirect F4 and hash headers so whatever I've got selected as my table it will give me a list of the column headers for there so on report two I've got some data validation in here and the data validation is set to be master h4 hash so that then will give me the drop down list of oh i gone to the wrong one we shouldn't be there yet oops let's go back this one here um gives me the drop down list so i can now select what i want to be here so if i wanted that to be region way i'm now looking region that way and I'm looking at product that way. Or I could have instead, let's look at color. Yep. Um, and, well, you know, we could change the columns instead. So I could have column by um, name if I wanted, couldn't I? But color by name not really terribly interesting but there we go so easily now just by selecting the um what we want to be the column i'm going to go back to being product and i'm going to go back to being um name <clears throat> And we got that as being value, but what if we said, no, we don't want value. We want to look at the numbers that we sold instead. So that's made it much easier. I haven't got to go in. I haven't got to alter any formula. So how did we do it? Well, we got the same thing here with our, what, what they are, but no, what we've said is that the row is indirect 
C4, which is the table name, and quotes, open square bracket quote, and whatever is in C5, and quotes, closing square bracket quote. Now we have to pass that to indirect to turn it into something which uh, Excel can understand as being the table name and a table header name. And if we do the same thing with column and the same thing with data, then we're doing the same sum ifs. It's sum ifs data where row is J8 hash and column is L5 hash. But instead of having the call and the row fixed, we're now changing them according to what our selection has been here. So the formula is not altering now. It's just how the thing is being picked up. Um, and the same thing applies to these formulae here. You know, again, <clears throat> column is indirect and data is indirect, that and so on. So it's just a nice, easier way to make it a useful thing without having to alter a formula. But I didn't want to stop there. I said, okay, well, what if we want to make the row and column sorted ascending? Oh, I can't spell ascending, can I? Uh, or descending. <clears throat> well, I've put some other little things in here where I've got a an option of one and minus one. So if I say I want the name to be minus one, we, Zach's come to the top of the list and Alan's gone to the bottom. And if I said I want my product sorted uh, descending, then I got Samsung first going down to Blackberry. So, again, so what have we done there? Well, it's not there, is it? It's, it's here. I'm uh, sorry. It's here, right. <clears throat> Source is indirect C4 and brackets C6 and brackets. List normal. Transpose sort unique source, comma, comma, E6. And E6 is the direction. Um, ooh, this is actually for the next, the next sheet, but all right. Let's, let's go on to the next sheet. I then said, well, okay, that's fine. I'm sorting by names. What if I want to sort by value? So now I've said I want the name sorted descending by the value of sales. So way good old Roger comes to the top of the list. And the product, again, iPhone has come top because that. So if I then back to said, no, we'll have it sorted by name. And we got a descending. So again, we can say, no, we want that to be ascending. <clears throat> so now we can sort each of these things either by name or by value, ascending or descending. And again, that's where this bit came in, which I started to show you. So list by name is just sort unique in the direction that's given by what's in E6. List value is sort by list N m3 hash e6 now i've had to cheat because if we unhide rows right i've had to put these up here because otherwise we'd get a circular reference because i can't sort this i <laughs> I can't sort by itself, so I would get a circular reference. So I've put 
the thing up there and then sorting that. So I can then just use that here by saying, well, um, sorry, wrong one. List V sort by list N, which we'd already said what that was, but do it by M3 hash, which is the values that we've calculated here that belong to each of those names, but do it in the direction of E6. Okay? And then we just say, if G6 is equal to V, as value, give me list V. Otherwise, give me list N. So I got two different sorts there, and that's selected according to what is in cell G6. And the same thing applies on the, the name, but it's by whatever is in G5. Okay, so we got this name, this value again, sorted those different ways. Um, I wasn't happy to stay there. What if we could switch between sum and count? So hmm, I thought, right, what if we were to put another couple of fields in here? And we got calc, and that's a drop down, which is just a drop down of some ifs, count ifs, average ifs, min ifs, max ifs, and if, min ifs. Okay, so we can select what we want to see, and then choice is merely the list, and then match whatever it is in C9 to the list, comma zero. Okay. So now, how does the formula work? What does it look like? Uh, right. It's been wrapped in an if error function. I'll tell you why in just a moment. So we got let row is the indirect C4 and C5 with the brackets in them. Same for data. And I've said F sum is sum ifs data row k8 hash f count is count ifs we don't need the data bit all we need is row and k8 and average is average ifs data row k8 and result choose c10 f sum f count f av nothing or nothing because the max and the min wouldn't be appropriate here for what we're looking for, so we're not bothering with them. And then when we come to this formula here, we got the same thing, but we've also got uh, the Fs, by the way, a function sum, function count, function average, function max, function min. And we're always dealing with data, we're dealing with row K8, and we're dealing with column and M5. But all we're changing is some ifs, count ifs, average ifs, max ifs, and min ifs. And then the result we want is choose C10, comma, F sum, F count, F av, F max, F min. So now, if I say I want the count, I'm just seeing the count of the various sales. If I said I want to see the average value, I've now got the average values. And that's why we had to put the if error in, because if there aren't any sales of a product, we would get the divide by zero error. So, you know, we can now switch back and forth between max ifs and min ifs and our some and again we can either be looking at the value or the quantity and so on so now we have got a very 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 easy way of changing what we're looking at 
in there without having to alter the formula that we built. In the same way, if I said here, I, I can do my testing, the same thing. If I just said, you know, what is, uh, Um, F of, I get the thing there, but I mean, you know, so you can go and look and see what any one of your things would be by making that just a separate thing. So I'll go back to result. Now, I know what a lot of you will be thinking. Well, God, that's a hell of an effort to go and do that. Why waste all that time on doing that? Well, the reason is, what if we started off with that same sheet, but blank? Uh, what well, say I said, let's go and get some other data. Now, let me just shut this down a minute. Some of you may have noticed a funny little symbol up on the top here. And that's a tab. This is a little add-in that was created by Sam Rodakovitz. Sam is one of the program managers on the Excel team. Oh, a really great guy. Um, Currently, he's been doing a lot of work on the new rich data types and especially the new Wolfram data. But he created this little add-in for producing fake data. So if I said I wanted a table uh, of sales, bang, it's created me some data. Um, and, you know, just like that, you can just go and do it and create, and you can you can add to the data, and you can uh, have text, and you can say different types. You want books or people, and you can have another column, and it can have random numbers in it or dates in it, and all sorts of things you can select. This is um, an add-in which uh, Sam has made available to people. If you go to his, if you look up Sam Radakovitz, uh, or Sam Rad, as he's known, uh, you can download this file if you, I think I have to send him an email. But it's a great, useful little tool for creating some data. But I thought to myself, well, let's go and um, add another column here and randomize. Oh no, I think we've got to go put a number first of all. Whole, whole number. Um, do, 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 what did I want to do? There was something I was going to do. What did I do before? Because it was much bigger. Let's pick a data set that I got. Let's start again. Oh, that's better. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, that's got far too many things in it. I didn't want to do that. So I wanted to create some groups and some regions. So if I just do add myself region, and I'm going to say region equals um, index that Oh. 
dollars are, dollars three, go along, dollars are, dollars eight, eight, comma, rand between one, comma, six. R3, R8, sorry, right. Okay, so I've created some regions that belong to this and I wanted some groupings again. What do they want to group by? Um, okay. Group. And we do the same thing equals index. And between one comma eight and F for those right, that'll do. Now uh, this table Got a name, okay. Uh, insert. Oh. Why isn't it showing me a table name? It won't let me insert the table, so it must be a table. It hasn't got the table ribbon tab showing, so perhaps it's just uh, an array with filters on that are stopping it being converted. Yeah, it allowed me to do it before. You're trying to convert to a table? Yeah. Remove the filters, control shift L first. Now try, see what that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right right Might need a little reopen. Let us copy. It won't do control T in the, anymore then. It is a table. I think Excel's just got a bit funny. Oh, okay. Uh, Not something I've encountered, I'm glad to say. Uh, yeah. It's got a little corner in the bottom right. Oh, has it? Okay. Yeah. Couldn't see the bottom right. No, I just clocked it as he scrolled down. It's just been funny. It's got a little thing down there. Yeah. Little fly speck. <laughs> I think you probably just need to close and reopen him just to wake it up a bit. All right, let's just save that file. Is it open? Oh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, blast. No worries, buddy. Well, <clears throat> what I was going to say to you was that and it does work because I did it earlier today. Um, on my master here then, I create the table. I called it underscore TB Sam. 
then I selected TB Sam there. So it then gave me the list of headers from that brand new table. And then when I went back to here, I made the source TB Sam, which I can't do here. Um, and then I had the headers for TB Sam, and I could bring those in. And without doing anything whatsoever, I had my new report based on a brand new table I'd never ever seen before. And that was supposed to have made you all go, wow. <laughs> but it went, ooh. <laughs> so at that point, I'm going to have a sip of water and then I'll answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Cool. Oh. <laughs> Are you getting some wows in a way, Roger? Well, I'm sorry, it didn't, it didn't all go quite as planned. We had a few little hiccups there, but never mind. <laughs> I, hope you, I hope you got the idea that LET is allowing you to almost write a complete program in a cell, and it makes it easy to read and easy to follow. So that's it. That's what I want you to take away from today. <laughs> it's so good. Thank you. Um, Sorry. Are there were, any questions? Uh, there were a couple earlier. Um, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to uh, get them going. Uh, there was one about errors earlier. I can't find it. Where are you? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's going back like a little bit, um, but in one of your filter examples where you got the calc errors and mm -hmm. then you, you wrapped the if error around it to solve it. Yeah. We're just wondering if the built-in kind of error handling of filter would have taken care of it. Um, I've noticed there's a few things that will give you calc errors where you might not expect them. Um, where can I give you an example? Oh, I know. I can give you an example of it right here. Um, right, unique, okay. If I go back to my data table, when I change that back to, I think it was Barry before, and it was not that it matters who it is really, but let's put Simon in there. And now I go back to, oh my, what's happening to my mouse though? Oi! <laughs> My mouse is going absolutely bloody mad. You ever fed it? I don't believe this. I don't believe this. Uh, anyway, it's back again. Um, if I go back to the sort, right. Where I was looking for those unique things, I've now got a hash calc error. And that's because neither, there isn't any unique item mm -hmm. in that table. Now, I would have thought it shouldn't return a calc error. It should perhaps come up and say, no uniques or whatever. But I haven't bothered to take that up with Joe. Again, Joe, I think Joe's been on um, paternity leave. He had a, a young baby girl a couple of months ago, and I think he's been, I think he's been off, so I've not bothered to trouble him. But I think, you know, that's something I would have not expected to see a hash calc error just because it doesn't exist. But that's what does happen. So again, where I found those things, and on the others, the one with filter, I'm sure, was the same I was getting with my average ifs. Of course, if there aren't any sales, then an average yeah. is going to give you, uh, you know, divide by zero error. So that's why. And the other reason for wrapping things in an if error is exactly that 
if I let's go back to report four, if I was going to change and say I was going to use a different table, so I'll just go and delete the table at the moment. Right, I would see errors all over the place because it didn't have the table name to put with the column header to give me the answers. But by putting an if error in there, while I'm switching between things, I won't see a heap of errors all over the screen. Makes it a bit hard to debug, though. What, the putting the if error in? A blank screen. Oh, a blank screen. <laughs> well, but as soon as I put, a t put something back yeah, in there, I've I got know. it again. So, you know. um, but I mean, I put that there deliberately so I wouldn't see rubbish in between selecting mm. different things and moving them yeah. around. Um, and when I went chose to have an average ifs as well, where we have some zero values. So, yeah, but to, to go back to that question, which arose from filter, um, I don't know. I, I don't know why, but I suspect it's because there wasn't any data matching the set of criteria. Hey, buddy. Yes, I noticed you use, as I do, the alternating pattern with the the alt enter every alternate line. Yeah. So, I think everybody does. So I'm not sure. Do do some people do straggling out with altern alternating parameters to the right? That's <laughs> Right, else. So Peter's being fancy. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pe Peter is being em eminently sensible. <laughs> okay. What is a straggling else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it does. But I, I would rather like to be able to put in a different uh, separator. So if you have the comma between the name and the formula. Yeah. And then a semicolon, say, which will give you the line feed and take you on to the next line and have real support for this alternate, this uh, new line as if it was meant. And then, then the formula would be much more readable. It's, uh... Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy just to, you know, <laughs> Show an alt end in, and I, then I can see it. I mean, yeah, that could all be written out as one long row. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, but it looks horrible, and it would horrible be horrible mm. to deal with. Um, yeah. Let's go and just do it here somewhere. Equals formula text. Yeah, I, I think it looks sufficiently right. bad. If you, want, if, if you want to read that and work your way through it, then, you know, it would drive me nuts. Absolutely nuts if I had to try and, you know, write and decipher that. It's so much easier. And again, I mean, I, I, I put some things in. I just covered them up. I, I just put them into some text boxes, again, just to make it a bit bigger. I, I didn't, oh, wouldn't you stop playing about? Get out. Ah. You got little gremlins in your machine, Roger. I have. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to blame my son. He's because he's been in the office. There we are. You know, that's. I just did things like this because if people couldn't read my formula, you know, it's a bit bigger in here to be able to go and read it. And, you know, it's, it's to me, it's much easier. You know, we've got one line for everything, it's much easier to see what you're doing. But horses for courses. If you're only writing very short formulae, it doesn't matter. But once you get into some big and complicated formulae, I think it is much nicer to set it out, you know, with the with the alt enter between each thing. Yeah. Works still, just the same with no matter which way you do it. I think it looks much better like that and so I, no, like I, I, I agree entirely, Peter. We know we're 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 in harmony here. Yep. It's just the rest of the world. <laughs> 
Uh, this is where I can uh, upset Oz. Those M5... <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> no, you won't upset my good friend Oz. He doesn't <laughs> upset him with anything. No. <laughs> All right. How are you now. doing there, Oz? So, so that's good. M, that good. M5, M5 yeah. hash, if I wanted a name... That's good. Would you name the M5 hash, or mm. would you put the name in for the M5 and then add the hash to the name? Which naming convention would you use? Well, uh, to be honest, in this particular case, I, I I wouldn't even be worried about giving M5 a name. Um, well, what is M5? Is it... I don't even know. It is a product. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had to go looking at your screen to find it's a product. Why, why can't it just tell me? No, it isn't a product. M5. It, it isn't then. It's M M5, M5, is, M5. is a, a list of names. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. List of product names. Uh, actually, with, with, it, it, with it yours, a, you can. It's a cell reference, nothing else. Yeah, and and your check, I mean, you know, yours if, is changeable. If you want to, we we could. Now, what did I? I did something the other day where I put that in, and I can't think where it was. What file I did it in? Um, well, I called something product and something products. So where you know in a let function and then it, you know yeah mm. you can do if you wanted yeah. you know we could put a line in here which says let m let prod be m5 and then we could do oh m5 hash and then uh, let's put prod there yeah, actually, I, I would be a bit cautious about putting a name in for that because but that's I'm one of your fancy for ones. Things. I don't like long names. Oh, I do. I, I like to have a bloody good read. <laughs> that, uh, that, uh... <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm and, not into uh, writing War and Peace, as I told you. I'm a lazy person. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, yeah, like you, yeah. Peter, well, probably I, I, I got involved with computers before you did. But, you know... Back in the day, I mean, the first computer I used at university, which took up the whole floor of the physics block, had a massive 8K of RAM. Now, every yeah. bit was important there, never mind a byte. And you didn't waste anything. You typed everything as short as you possibly could. And which is why I still use, even in my VBA code, I use very, very short variable names. And I hate it when I see long VBA code with long names in it. And even worse, long file names and long tab names. So by the time you get to where the cell reference is, Christ, you're bored. You're yes, absolutely yes. bored. You've read up that much. Oh, no, no, it's not yeah. for me. Yeah, there are like some some that. I'm an old boy. You've got to look after the age, you know. <laughs> hey, guys, we're, we're running out of time. Um, wanted to make sure you got, got your thank yous, Roger. So thanks for taking your time out, uh, producing an excellent presentation. Um, I know you can't see the chat box, but people have been saying thank you and... Uh, congratulating you on your, your demonstration in that chat window. So I'll pass that on. Um, yeah. Don't want more to say. Cheers, buddy. <laughs> well, it was, it was a, all I can say is I've had great fun, fun tonight. Yeah, I, yeah. I haven't been on the receiving end, so it's easy. <laughs> I, I hope yeah. you've all enjoyed it, because I've certainly no, you, enjoyed presenting it to you. And, you, uh, you enjoy I'd love to do us. another session with you sometime or the other. If you want to get into something really, really good now, we've got these um, rich data types. Yeah. Oh. And <laughs> which, you know, like stock or 
the rest of it. But, but you got to watch out for him. Tell the truth. The tell the truth, you, Roger. Yeah, but no, 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 no. The great thing is that okay. now, now, you can go and create your own rich data types. So you can go and get a product list, you know, with SKU number and size and color and all the rest of it. And you can use Power Query to turn that in to a rich data type list. And then as you hover over the cell, you'll see the card as a drop down with all the information on it. But being able to create your own, ah, uh, absolutely bloody marvelous. So are you going to be great great demonstrating that? I haven't had a chance that? to play with it yet. I had, or Minter Tracy. It it's, oh, it's great. Minter Tracy's already... done some on that, hasn't she? I made a video, Peter. Did, Have yeah. you? Okay, then. Send <laughs> yeah. it to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, 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 it's great stuff. And if you think that the let function is good, and I hope you do, by God, wait to see what you've got coming. You just <laughs> wait till you see what you've got coming, because it's gonna, it's gonna blow your minds. It will absolutely blast you out of this planet. <laughs> just keep watching this space, because those boys over in Redmond, they're working like little beavers over there. Even they may be not out of the office, but they're still working hard, and there's some great stuff on the way. <laughs> Put another. It'll be a while yet. But worth waiting do you for. Do you want to put your video link in the chat box, Oz? Oh, okay. All right. Thanks, Oz. Yes. Yeah, they're uh, they're really interesting, and they do sound, some weird. Sound they... seems to be breaking up for me. I don't know whether it is oh. with all of you lot, but yeah. No, but the custom data types Watch. are are really interesting. Oh, they are. Yeah, but they do some spooky stuff though, as far as like, um, <laughs> like you visually see duplicates, and then if you have custom uh, uh, conditional format and identified duplicates, it won't find them, right? Because the stuff that's hidden in the card is different, right? But then if you pull it out, then things can look like duplicates that are not duplicates. You gotta you gotta know your data with the custom data types. But oh, and with those Wolframs, they're weird because like activities. You can put how many calories does fencing burn? Does um sleeping burn? How many calories does dancing burn? Error message. <laughs> it's not there. <laughs> so you gotta know that kind of stuff. It it doesn't have everything. It's waiting for you to do the calculation of, then you I'm put not. it in there. <laughs> All right. Okay. You start dancing and I'll measure the <laughs> calories as they come off. <laughs> yeah. See, that's, that's my job. <laughs> Oz, if I started dancing, the floor in this office would collapse and I'd be downstairs with the family. Well, the more the merrier. <laughs> I, I, I hadn't thought of sleeping as a new form of exercise. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Alan, oh, and Rico is here. And I, I got to say, you know what? Before all this, this lockdown and stuff, it was really a pleasure to meet Peter and Haran in real life. I, I'm exists. glad I got to do that. <laughs> we even found our way down to the bar, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Necessity. Yeah. <laughs> we will be back soon. We will meet again. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. I hope so. So obviously there's, there's a lot of uh, Londoners and UK people on here. But for those who are not, if you ever find yourself in London, uh, make sure you let us know. And uh, yeah, yeah, we'll make sure to, to try and meet up or if, if there is an event happening, you know. Yeah. yeah. 
Wait. Sure, Danielle's been over and managed to avoid us. I don't know why. Danielle. Yeah, Danielle <laughs> is here. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting quiet. You had a cup of coffee yet, Danielle? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have. Yay. Hey. So, <clears throat> the day has started. My problem now, Alan, is at this time of night, that should have been full of gin and tonic. And it's only water. So <laughs> I'm getting withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you'd run out of tonic. <laughs> <laughs> no time like the present, Roger. What was that, buddy? I said no time like the present, Roger. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I didn't hear that. <laughs> no time like the present. <laughs> I don't know why. why right. well, I think I'm going to have to go now, actually. Oh, no, man. But, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to have to say good night to you all because I, I, I must go downstairs and um, join the family. I've, uh, I've deserted them for a while and they may be hanging on to have their supper until I go down to join them. So uh, it's Roger. been a pleasure to be with you all. And thank you very, very much for listening to me ramble on. And I uh, hope to see you all again sometime soon. Well, sure. thank you, Roger. I do. Good. See you later. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Later. See you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Mm. Right, better close this out, Taya. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Thank you guys Good for everybody. joining. We will see you soon. Absolutely. Right. We will. Das, das for Daniel. Das for Daniel. Have a great evening and great day, Daniel. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.